There were a number of turtle doves on the island, but it was difficult to hunt them as they would fly from one valley to another, and it took an intrepid walker to follow them. Santini, whose chores were limited to serving the table or announcing visitors when the emperor was in the drawing room, spent his morning at this exercise. He shot very well and managed to kill some. Two or three times a week, they were served for the emperor's luncheon, and he found them excellent. General Gorgo tried to introduce rabbits into the Longwood woods by releasing a few of them. They were seen for a time, then they disappeared completely. A pheasant, very rare on the island, shot around Plantation House, was offered to the emperor by the hunter. When the governor learned the emperor had wanted none of the objects he had sent and knew of the distribution he had made of them, he got very angry. But the emperor had seen the objects as an insult to both himself and his officers. The men they were anxious to see and hear were the French, Russian, and Austrian commissioners. It was possible to learn the true state of affairs in France through them, if they were given to talking. During their horseback rides, these gentlemen attempted to see them and managed to engage them in conversation. The Marquis de Montchenu had letters for Countess Bertrand and Countess Cassis. The commissioners did not hide their desire to be received at Longwood. The emperor declared he would receive them as private individuals, but not in their official capacity of commissioners. The first time they came to Longwood, they came up to the gate in the moat between the guardhouse and the house. The governor was not anxious for the commissioners to come to Longwood, but did not dare forbid this officially. They, in fact, did not attempt to come in any farther. The emperor, informed by one of his staff that they were there, asked me for his spyglass and threw a slit in the shutter, saw them perfectly. The Grand Marshal, General Gorgo, Council of Casas, and General Montalon went out to talk with them. They felt that Longwood was the worst part of the island and the last place in which to live because of the temperature variations. The Russian commissioner said they would be the laughing stock of Europe when people heard that. Having come to St. Helena, they had departed without seeing the emperor. Boredom was already catching up with them, and they complained about the cost of supplies and the poor food. The Marquis de Montchenu spoke of asking for a new allowance from the king's governor, government. The emperor later told these men that he could offer them the books in his library if reading would help them fight off boredom. A pneumatic machine was sent to Longwood, and the emperor put General Gorgo in charge of its operation. He and Admiral Malcolm came to see it work. The general offered each one a cup of ice water, the surface of which had frozen within 15 minutes. The emperor took it. And as he chipped the ice, he spoke of the pleasure they would have felt putting such a piece of ice in their mouths when they were crossing the desert on their way to Syria. This machine, the first seen on the island, was taken to General Gurgo's quarters on the emperor's orders so he could conduct some tests. He made an unsuccessful experiment with lemonade and others with milk that did not succeed any better. The favorable first impression Admiral Malcolm had made on the emperor when he was introduced continued as long as he was on the island. The emperor regretted that he had not been placed in command, for he was sure his life would have been much easier than it could have ever been with Hudson Lowe. As he was so friendly with the emperor, Admiral Malcolm was received every time he came, even when he was sick. He would grant him access to his bedroom. As he was going out with him one day, the admiral noticed the tent placed a few yards from the house was in very bad condition. He had it replaced immediately with another one taken from his ship. As the emperor had no shade around his house, he often went under his tent to seek shelter from the sun. He also had lunch and worked there. The entrance faced the guardhouse so that he could see the people coming to Longwood. If it happened to be the governor... The emperor immediately returned inside the house. That man, he said, turns my stomach. He is devoid of any politeness or learning. I cannot bear to see him. On August 15th, these gentlemen and the ladies came as they had the year before to pay their respects to the emperor, who kept them all to lunch with him. The children were also invited, as well as Dr. Omira. According to his custom, the emperor gave presents to the children, who were quite happy and contributed to making this family luncheon joyful. Dr. Baxter 
who had come to the island to care for the emperor had Dr. Omira request on his behalf the honor of being presented. The emperor accepted and asked, laughing, whether the other doctor had killed as many patients as he had. The emperor had very little faith in medicine, which he said had not advanced because it worked in the shadows, whereas surgery was destined to make many brilliant discoveries. Having learned his cook was sick, the emperor asked Dr. Omira for news of him. He replied that, though young, he was a worn-out man who did not have many years to live and that it was necessary to replace him for a few days. The governor, informed of this circumstance, offered a Belgian woman he had in his service who spoke French and knew how to cook. No matter how repugnant it was for the emperor to accept anyone from the hands of Hudson Lowe, he authorized Cipriani, his butler, to use her. Her cooking was not bad. She had a recipe for soup that the emperor liked very much. It consisted of two egg yolks beaten with a little flour, making a light paste that she dropped in the bouillon when it came to a boil. For the duration of Lepage's illness, she remained at Longwood, and when he began his convalescence, the emperor decided to keep her. A few months later, she married the cook, and a daughter was born. But afterwards, the woman's health, formerly excellent, became poor. That of her husband was not any better, and both of them were obliged to leave the island to return to France, where Lepage died a year later. He was replaced by an Englishman whose cooking was mediocre, but who remained in the position until the arrival of Chandelier sent by Princess Pauline. Under Admiral Cockburn, if supplies were not of good quality and complaints were brought to his attention, the Admiral took care that they should be delivered in better condition and would express his regret that the island did not offer more resources. Under the new administration, it was not the same. Not only was the quality often poor, but the quantity decreased. Cipriani complained of this to Sir Thomas Reed, who did not, like the Admiral, use the vigilance required to correct the supplier's negligence, so that we resorted to buying in town with the Emperor's funds that was lacking for the household needs. The Governor was informed of this and told Count de Montalon that the supplies were quite sufficient, but that they were not used economically. He came himself to tell the Grand Marshal that his governor, government allotted only 8,000 pounds sterling for the expenses of Longwood. He had taken it upon himself to add another 4,000, but they had to decrease the expenditures. He added that 8,000 pounds had been granted for the Longwood expenses in anticipation of a decrease in the household personnel. But as that had not taken place, any cost in the excess of 8,000 pounds sterling would have to be compensated by him. The emperor replied to the grand marshal that he was ready to pay all the expenses if he were given the opportunity to do so by contacting a banking house either in London or Paris, and if he could receive his letters unopened. Don't answer anything definitively. We don't have to bother with such details. Let him worry about it, the emperor concluded. Admiral Malcolm, whose mind was quite conciliatory, took advantage of the trust the emperor showed him to ask him to try to come to an agreement with the governor, and if possible, through mutual concessions, to reach a state of affairs more desirable for both of them. You do not know that man, the emperor told him. His mistrust is such that if I ask you to come riding with me, as you have come riding in my carriage, you will no longer have his trust. Believe me, he's a devious man, full of deceit and completely heartless. Whether this was pure coincidence or something agreed on by them, when the emperor came out to the garden, he saw the admiral and the governor arriving together and did not go inside as he usually did. He greeted the admiral graciously and the governor with cool politeness. The meeting would probably have proceeded smoothly had they only chatted about general topics. But the governor took advantage of this occasion to talk to the emperor about the necessary reduction in the Longwood expenses. The emperor, who did not expect anything less than this overture, did not give him a chance to finish his sentence and lost his temper in such a way that he came to regret it. The next morning, he told the doctor while he was dressing, but how could it be otherwise when faced with the rudeness of such details? I told him, settle this matter with my butler. Don't send anything if you like. I'll go and sit at the table of the officers of the 53rd Regiment. I'm sure there is not one of them who would refuse to share his dinner with an old soldier like myself. You have, I added, full power over my body, but my soul shall always elude you. 
know well that I am as proud on this rock as when I commanded all of Europe. Had you any honor, you would request your transfer. I believe he answered that he had requested it. Would you believe, doctor, the emperor added, that in front of the admiral, he dared claim he had changed nothing of what had been established by Admiral Cockburn. It was then no longer possible for me to hold back. I used very harsh words with him. I am not in the habit of insulting anyone, but the effrontery of this man was too much for me. I could not prevent myself from telling him exactly what I thought of him. The admiral had imagined I might change my mind about him. Never, I said to him. I judged him the very first day I saw him. His honest and loyal soul is taken advantage of by the other's deviousness. He thought he would justify himself by replying to my complaints that he was only obeying orders. And even then, not as harshly as he could. Sir, I said to him, there are certain professions that are given only to men who have qualified for them by dishonoring themselves. The executioner, just like you, says when he is torturing the man he's about to kill, I am only obeying orders. Were I less adept, I would make you suffer a great deal more. It was with these scathing words that the governor left the emperor. His heart filled with rage. He went to the grand marshal's house to talk to him about the fit of anger directed at him. But Colonel Bertrand refused to listen to him. Dr. Amira, who had spent the day in town, told the emperor he was with Colonel Reed when the governor arrived there. And that addressing him personally, he had told him in tones of violent anger, let General Bonaparte know that it depends on me to make his situation easier. But if he continues to show me no respect, I will make him experience my power. He is my prisoner. I have the right to treat him in accordance with the conduct, with his conduct. And if needed, I have the power to lock him up. The doctor added that Sir Hudson Lowe had told the officers of the 53rd with whom he had dinner that the emperor no longer wanted to see them because a red uniform made him sick. The emperor, who had finished dressing, went into the drawing room, taking the doctor with him, and called me to summon Captain Poppleton. Sir, the emperor said to him when he arrived, you are, I believe, the oldest captain in the 53rd. Please tell your comrades that they have been lied to. When it was insinuated that I no longer wanted to see them and that the sight of a red uniform made me sick, tell them that I shall always see them with pleasure. I have great esteem for the 53rd. It is a regiment of brave men who have fought against me valiantly. I like brave soldiers who have received the baptism of fire, no matter what flag they fight under. Captain Poppleton thanked the emperor for what he had just told him and assured him that the 53rd, full of respect and admiration for his person, would never believe such statements if they were made in front of his officers and his soldiers. In order to cover for the governor, he added he had no knowledge that such words had been spoken. The ice had been broken and the battle began. Sir Hudson Lowe had arrived in town trembling with anger. He had previously given official communication of the bill dated April 16, 1816, by which the Parliament sanctioned the Treaty of August 2, 1815, and all the British government's acts towards the Emperor. He availed himself of the discretionary power given to the ministry that determined the punishment incurred by anyone violating the restrictions prescribed for the Emperor's safekeeping. He was not long in making use of these, not abandoning his project of reducing the supplies. He sent Major Gorakir to Count de Montalon to ask him for a reply to his letter concerning the household expenses. The emperor at that time was engaged in preparing a reply to the communication of that same bill. He also did so for the letter. After making the corrections and having had it read back to him, he charged first me, then Saint-Denis, whose handwriting was much smaller than mine, with making copies on silk in order to secretly transmit them to Europe. That letter was dictated to Count de Montalon, signed by him, and sent to Plantation House. It contained the following, Longwood, August 23rd, 1816, General. I have received the treaty of August 2nd, 1815, concluded between His British Majesty, the Emperor of Austria, the Emperor of Russia, and the King of Prussia, which was attached to your letter of July 23rd. The Emperor Napoleon protests against the contents of this treaty. He is not the prisoner of England. Having abdicated in the hands of the nation's representatives for the benefit of the Constitution adopted by the French people in favor of his son, he went voluntarily and freely to England in order to live there as a private individual in retirement under the protection of British laws. The violation of all laws cannot, con 
constitute a right. In fact, the person of the Emperor Napoleon is in the power of Austria, Russia, and Prussia, even according to the laws and customs of England, which has never brought into the balance of prisoners the Russians, Austrians, Prussians, Spaniards, and Portuguese, although allied with these powers through treaties and making war jointly with them. The agreement of August 2nd, made two weeks after the Emperor Napoleon had arrived in England, can have no power under the law. It only offers the spectacle of the coalition of the four largest powers in Europe for the oppression of a single man, a coalition that disavows the opinion of all peoples and all the principles of sound morals. The emperors of Austria and Russia and the king of Prussia had, in fact, no right to take any action against the person of the emperor Napoleon, and therefore they could not make a ruling regarding him. Had the emperor Napoleon been in the power of the emperor of Austria, that prince would have remembered the relationship that religion and nature have placed between father and son, a relationship that is never violated with impunity, he would have remembered that four times Napoleon had restored his throne to him in Leo Ben in 1797 and in Lunaville in 1801 when his armies were at the Vienna Walls in Pressburg in 1806 and in Vienna in 1809 when his armies were in control of the capital and three quarters of the monarchy. This prince would have remembered the protestations he made to him at the Moravia bivouac in 1805 and during the Dresden meeting in 1812. Had the Emperor Napoleon's person been in the power of Emperor Alexander, he would have remembered the ties of friendship contracted at Tilsit and Erfurt and for five years as a result of daily contact. He would have remembered the Emperor Napoleon's conduct on the day after the Battle of Austerlitz, where, able to take him prisoner with the remnants of his army, he was satisfied with only his word and allowed him to retreat. He would have remembered the dangers that the Emperor Napoleon personally incurred to put out the Moscow fire and save his capital. Certainly this prince would not have violated the duty of friendship and gratitude toward a friend in adversity. Had the person of the emperor even been in the power of the king of Prussia, that sovereign would not have forgotten that it was up to the emperor after Friedland to place another prince on the Berlin throne. He would not have forgotten before a disarmed enemy, their protestations of devotion and the feelings he expressed to him in 1812 at Dresden. It can be therefore seen that in Articles 2 and 5 of said Treaty of August 2nd, that in no way able to influence the fate of the Emperor Napoleon's person, who is not in their power, these same princes deferred on this matter to what his British Majesty would do, and he took it upon himself to carry out all these obligations. These princes have criticized the Emperor Napoleon for having preferred the protection of British laws to their own. The false ideas which the Emperor Napoleon had of the liberality of British laws and the influence of a great people, generous and free, on its government led him to prefer the protection of these laws to that of his father-in-law or his former friend. The Emperor Napoleon was always free to ensure what was his own property through a diplomatic treaty, either by placing himself at the head of the Army of the Loire or at the head of the army of the Gironde, commanded by General Clausel, but seeking only retirement and the protection of the laws of a free nation under either British or American, any stipulations appeared to him needless. He believed that the British people would be more bound by a frank, noble, and trusting step than by the most solemn treaties. He was mistaken, but his error shall be a cause of shame for true Englishmen. And in present, as in future generations, it shall be proof of the disloyalty of the British administration. Austrian and Russian commissioners have arrived in St. Helena. If their mission's goal is to fulfill a part of the duties the emperors of Austria and Russia have contracted through the Treaty of August 2nd, and to make certain the British agents in a small colony in the middle of the ocean are not lacking in the respect to a prince connected to them through the ties of relationship and many other reasons, one can recognize in this move the mark 
of the character of these two sovereigns, but you, sir, have stated these commissioners had neither the right nor the power to have any opinion about what occurs on this rock. The British ministry had the Emperor Napoleon transported to St. Helena, 2,000 leagues from Europe. This rock, located below the tropics, 500 leagues from any continent, is subject to the extreme heat of this latitude and is covered with clouds and fog three quarters of the year. It is at once the driest and the dampest country in the world. This climate is the worst possible for the emperor's health. It is hatred that has governed the selection of this place, as it has the instructions given by the British ministry to the officers commanding in this country. They have been ordered to call Emperor Napoleon general, wanting to force him to recognize that he had never reigned in France. This has decided him not to adopt an incognito name, as he had resolved to do when he left France. First magistrate for life of the Republic, under the title of First Consul, he concluded the London preliminaries and the Treaty of Amiens with the King of Great Britain. He received as ambassadors Lord Cornwallis, Mr. Mary, Lord Whitworth, who have resided in his capacity at court. He has accredited to the King of England, Count Otto and General Andriossi, who resided as ambassadors at the court of Windsor, when after an exchange of letters between the ministers of the two monarchs, Lord Lauderdale came to Paris with the full powers of the King of England. He negotiated with the plenipotentiaries holding the full powers of the Emperor Napoleon and remained several months at the Tuileries court. Since at Châtillon, when Lord Castlerose signed the ultimatum that the Allied powers presented to the plenipotentiaries of the Emperor Napoleon, he recognized by this fourth dynasty. This ultimatum was more advantageous than the Treaty of Paris, but demanded that France give up Belgium and the left bank of the Rhine. This was contrary to the Frankfurt Proposition and to the proclamations of the Allied powers, and contrary to his coronation oath in which the emperor had sworn the integrity of the empire. The emperor believed the natural limits were necessary to the security of France as well as to the equilibrium of Europe. He believed that the French nation, in the circumstances in which it found itself, had better run the risk of war then abandoned this. France would have obtained this integrity and with it conserved its honor had treason not served the Allies. The Treaty of August 2nd, the bill of the British Parliament called the Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte and granted him only the title of General. The title of General Bonaparte is doubtlessly eminently glorious. The Emperor wore it at Lodi, Castiglione, Rivoli, Arcole, Leobin, the Pyramids, and Abukir, but for the past 17 years, he has carried the title of First Consul and of Emperor. It would mean agreeing he never was First Magistrate of the Republic nor Sovereign of the Fourth Dynasty. Those who believe nations are herds that, by divine right, belong to a few families are neither of this century nor even of the spirit of the English legislature which several times changed the order of its dynasty. This because major changes in opinion, which the reigning princes had not shared, in had made them the enemies of happiness and of the greater majority of that nation. For kings are nothing but hereditary magistrates who exist only for the welfare of nations and not the nations for the satisfaction of kings. This same spirit of hatred ordered that the Emperor Napoleon not be allowed to write or receive any letter without its being opened and read by the British ministers and the officers in St. Helena. In this manner, he was forbidden any possibility of receiving news from his mother, his wife, his son, his brothers, when he wished to avoid the inconvenience of seeing his letters read by low-ranking officers and send sealed letters to the Prince Regent. He was told they could only let open letters go through for those were the instructions of the ministry. This measure requires no comment. It will give a strange idea of the spirit of administration that dictated it. It would be disavowed by the Bay of Algiers. Letters have arrived for general officers in the retinue of the emperor. They were opened and were handed to you. You did not pass them on because they had not gone through the British ministry. It was necessary to have them travel another 4,000 leagues. And these officers learned with sorrow there was on this rock news from their wives, their mothers, and their children, and that they could receive it only in six months. This turns the stomach 
It was not possible to subscribe to the Morning Con Chronicle, the Morning Post, or a few French newspapers. From time to time, a few censored issues of the Times have been sent to Longwood at the request made on board the Northumberland. A few books were sent, but those pertaining to the affairs of recent years were carefully excluded. Since then, we have wanted to correspond with the bookstore in London to order directly the books we might need, and those relative to current events. This was prevented. An English author, having written A Voyage to France and having had that book printed in London, took the trouble of sending it to you to offer it to the emperor, but you did not believe you could give it to him because it had not reached you through your government's channel. It is also said that several books sent by their authors were not handed over because they contained the inscription to the Emperor Napoleon and others to Napoleon the Great. The British Ministry is not authorized to order any of these violent acts. British parliamentary law, though immoral, considers the Emperor Napoleon a prisoner of war. And never has it been forbidden for prisoners of war to subscribe to newspapers or to receive printed books. Such an interjection applies only to the dungeons of the Inquisition. The island of St. Helena is 10 leagues around. It is inaccessible from any direction. Brigs surround the coastline. Outposts placed along the shoreline are in sight of one another and make it impractical to communicate with the sea. It is only through the little town of Jamestown that ships can drop anchor and depart to prevent any individual from leaving the island. It is enough to watch the coast by land and by sea. In forbidding access to the interior of the island, the only goal can be to deprive the emperor of an eight or 10 mile ride easily made on horseback, whose lack, according to the opinion of men of the art, will shorten his days. The emperor has been settled at Longwood, exposed to all winds, on a land that is sterile, uninhabited, without water, and incapable of sustaining crops. There is an enclosure of about 7,000 feet, totally without vegetation. A thousand feet away, on a hillock, there is a camp, and another one has just been established at the same distance in the opposite direction so that in the midst of the tropical heat no matter where one looks only camps can be seen admiral malcolm having understood the usefulness of a tent in such a position had one erected by sailors 20 paces in front of the house it is the only place where shade can be found however the emperor can only be satisfied with the spirit moving the officers and soldiers of the 53rd regiment as he was with the crew of the northumberland the Longwood House was built to serve as a storage shed for the farm of the India Company. Since then, the lieutenant governor of the island had a few rooms built there. It served him as a country house, but it was no way suitable as a permanent residence. Since we have been here, work has gone on without stopping, and the emperor continually bears the inconvenience of an unhealthy atmosphere of a house under construction. The room in which he sleeps is too small to hold a bed of normal size, but any new construction at Longwood would only prolong the inconvenience of having workmen around. However, on this miserable island, there exists some beautiful locations offering fine trees, gardens, and houses, and among them, there's Plantation House. But the specific instructions of the ministry forbid you to give this house, which would have spared your treasury a great deal of expense used to build at Longwood some shacks covered with tar paper which are already uninhabitable you have forbidden any contact between ourselves and the inhabitants of the island you have in fact placed the Longwood house in total isolation you have even prevented communication with the officers of the garrison it appears that great care has been taken to deprive us of the few resources offered by this miserable land and it is exactly as if we were on the wild and inhabited rock of Ascension Island. For the four months that you have been in St. Helena, you have, sir, worsened the Emperor's position. Count Bertrand has pointed out that you were violating even the laws of your legislature, trampling underfoot the rights of general officers, prisoners of war. You replied that you knew only the letter of your instructions, that they were even worse then your conduct appears to us. Signed, General Count de Montalon. P.S. 
I had signed this letter, sir, when I received your own dated the 17th. You attached to it the detailed account of an annual sum of 20,000 pounds sterling that you consider necessary to meet the expenses of the Longwood establishment. After having made the reductions you felt were possible, a discussion of this itemized list can be in no way of any concern to us. The emperor's table offers the bare and strictest minimum. All the provisions are poor quality and four times as expensive as in Paris. You asked the emperor to provide a fund of 12,000 pounds sterling for all of these expenses. I had the honor of telling you the emperor had no funds, that for one year he had neither received nor written a letter, and that he knew nothing of what was going on or could be going on in Europe. Transported by force to this rock 2,000 leagues away without being able to write any letter, he is today entirely at the discretion of British agents. The emperor had always wished and wishes to provide for all these expenses himself, and he shall do so as soon as you make it possible for him by removing the interdiction whereby the island inhabitants may not be used for his correspondence, and when it shall be submitted to no inquisition on your part or that of any of your agents, as soon as the people in Europe know the emperor's needs, those who take an interest in him will send the necessary funds. Lord Bathurst's letter, which you have shown me, gives rise to some strange thoughts. Are your ministers not aware that the spectacle of a great man faced with adversity is the most sublime of them all? Do they not know that Napoleon and St. Helena, in the midst of persecutions of all sorts to which he opposes nothing but serenity, is greater, more sacred, more venerable than the foremost throne in the world? where he was for so long the arbiter of kings? Those who, in this position, do not show Napoleon respect only to base their own character and the nation they represent. Signed, General Count de Montalon. 